friends, welcome back to Food Prep Guide. Do you see all this stuff behind me that looks kind of kind of gross? <laughs> that is a bunch of pork fat and we are going to be rendering lard today. If you missed our introduction to the pantry challenge video, we gave you a sneak peek of what we would be, what we would be doing during January's pantry challenge as part of the Three Rivers challenge and that is giving you a sneak peek behind the scenes of what goes into being able to not grocery shop or only grocery shop once a month or even once every two months. So last year's pantry challenge, I learned that we ran out of butter very quickly. So this year I planned ahead and I thought, okay, before January 1st hits, I'm going to get my hands on some lard that I can render or some pig fat that I can render down into lard. And then I can use, I can save my butter for baking and use the lard for all of our sauteing our vegetables and frying and things like that. Um, uh, just for like a couple of tips and things like that is if you do want to use lard as in place of butter, you can as far as, or excuse me, as far as baking goes, you can, but you're going to want the, a higher quality pig fat than what I have here. And uh, I think it's called leaf, leaf fat. And it's uh, just, it's, it can be used for pastries and baking and things like that. And it doesn't have that piggy type taste to it. This type of pork fat that I have here is going, it's in the large chunks. And this is going to have a little bit of that bacony, piggy type flavor to it, but that's perfectly fine because we're going to be using it to saute our vegetables in and it's just going to add a little bit of flavor um, and that's going to be wonderful. So the reason why I wanted to learn how to render lard and gather lard before January ran around is because lard is shelf stable when you render it properly. And even though it is shelf stable, a lot of people still choose to refrigerate their, the, the jar that they're working through at the moment and then freeze the rest. But I've done a lot of research into this and I am confident that the lard will last on the shelf if I would use this process for at least a year, if not longer. And when I open a jar, I am going to store that open jar in the fridge and we'll use that until we're ready for a new jar. I have about 15 pounds of pork fat here that I'm going to be doing and from what I understand, this is my first time rendering lard so I'm not an expert by any means, but from what I understand from my research I can reasonably expect to get about one pint of rendered lard from one pound of pig fat. So since I have 15 pounds here, I'm estimating about 15 pints that we'll end up with which will be more than enough for a year's supply. I'm kind of guessing here that I would use about a pint per month, which would mean we would only need about 12 pints to get us through the year. Um, but I went ahead and just the way that the pounds were packaged, I just went ahead and picked up 15 pounds. This was, um, we don't raise pigs, and so I had needed to source it locally. And if you are uh, watch this video and are interested, you would just want to find a pig farm around your area. Ours, um, we are blessed to have a heritage pig farm that is the really high quality um, hogs that this and clean that these um, that this pig fat has come from. It was about two dollars a pound just to give you an idea for a budget um, if you're interested in doing this. Okay so the first step of oops my camera's falling. Hey, hold on a minute. Here we go. Okay the first step of rendering pig fat is going to be chopping it into very small pieces. From what I understand the smaller the pieces the faster the process is going to go. This is a long and slow process, kind of like slow cooking in a crock pot, and it can take hours and hours. Some people even go overnight with it. It's about one o'clock in the afternoon, and I want to have this rendered down before I go to bed tonight. We'll see. I don't know if that's going to be possible, but in order to increase my chances of that being possible, I'm going to chop up this pig fat as small as I possibly can. I've even seen people grind it before putting it into their pot for cooking because that gets it down really small but I don't I do have a grinder but for some reason I just don't want to use it on this I feel like it's going to get really stuck in all the gears and stuff but anyway we'll see and you can do this on the stove top in a really large pot you can do it in a crock pot or you can do what I'm going to be doing which is in a stove top oven roaster this goes down all the way to 150 degrees Fahrenheit, which we want to start out really low at that temperature and then we'll I'll, I'll increase it and I'll walk you through all of that as I do it. So for this first step, I'm just going to start loading up this oven roaster. I'm going to cut the pig, pat, pig fat just as small as I can and start throwing it into the oven roaster.
I did hear a tip from someone. I can't remember who it was now. It may have been. No, it wasn't. I was going to say Deep South Homestead may have been. I'm not sure. But their tip was to keep your pork fat somewhat frozen, like thaw it from the freezer before cutting into it, but not all the way because it allows you to make smoother cuts and chop it a lot easier. And I think people who grind it instead of cutting it like I'm doing here, I think that's what they do. So what I did was I took my pork fat out of the freezer about two hours ago and I've been just kind of letting it soften and thaw out. And it is, uh, you know, it's not completely thawed out. It is still a little bit frozen and it does seem to be uh, making me be able to have some nice clean cuts. I don't really have anything to compare it to since this is my first time doing it, but it's just, I was kind of thinking that cutting fat was going to be kind of difficult because, you know, it's just a glob of fat. <laughs> but it's actually going pretty smoothly. So I think that tip to keep it partially frozen is a good one. Okay, here's about how small I'm trying to cut it, just to give you a size reference. About smaller than a marble, about the size of a marble. That's kind of what I'm aiming for. And I'm just going to do this for the entire 15 pounds. I'm looking at how much this is and I'm like, oh dear, I'm probably still going to be cutting an hour from now. Maybe that's why they use grinders. <laughs> I might have to switch to that. I don't know. But I'm going to keep on cutting and we will be back at the next step when I have this thing full and show you the next step after that. Welcome to Food Prep Guide. My name is Jordan. I'm a homeschooling mom to three, living on three beautiful acres with my wonderful husband. A health crisis forced our family to change the way we think about food. Unfortunately, it also put us in financial hardship. Thankfully, the solution to both challenges was the same, to live off the land as much as possible. For us, that means growing a garden, preserving the harvest, raising chickens, and cooking from scratch. It's definitely a family affair. And friends, too. Meet Stacy, researcher, author, and lifelong learner. She entered the world of food preservation in the crazy days of 2020. She joined a gleaning co-op, and a local grocer offered her clearance produce in bulk. And so the adventure began. Together, we're reclaiming the old ways of food stewardship and teaching them to the next generation. If there's one thing you should know about us, it's that we love Jesus and seek to steward his blessings wisely. Our table always has room for one more, so y'all come join us. Okay, so as you can see, I switched to the grinder. <laughs> it took all of maybe five, ten minutes of chopping by hand before I realized this is not going to work. I should have gone with what the expert said, which is use the grinder, and that's what I did. I did I'd, at first, I tried my manual grinder, and it was going to be just as hard and slow as chopping with a knife. So I upgraded to my automatic grinder. This was gifted to me by my mother in love many years ago, and it was her dad's. So this thing is old, but it is a powerhouse. Um, so what I did was I just, I've been grinding. I've only gone through about five pounds. And I wanted to show you this next step because it's important. It's important not to scorch the fat or burn the fat at any point during the rendering down process. So what I have done is I've just got enough to cover the bottom of my oven roaster and then I'm going to pause. I'm not going to continue filling it up just a minute or just right now. And I'm going to go ahead and turn my oven roaster on the lowest heat setting possible, which on mine is 150 degrees. Um, so to keep it from scorching, man, my camera is giving me some issues today. To keep it from scorching on the bottom, we need a little bit of liquid to prevent that scorching. And I've seen this done two ways. One, sometimes people put a little bit of water in the bottom of their pot just for that first layer of lard to keep it from scorching. Um, but my end goal with this is to make it shelf stable. So I don't want to introduce any water. Um, so what I'm doing is another method that I have seen done before, and that's to start it out extremely low and slow and melt this down very slowly so that it forms a decent amount of liquid on the bottom which is just the fat already starting to start the rendering down process and that way we don't have to add water and once I see that there's about half an inch to an inch of liquid in the bottom from that rendered fat then I can go ahead and start loading in more and then we won't have to worry about any scorching 
So that's what I'm going to do. I've got this down on low, 150 degrees, and I'm going to wait for that to produce a little bit of liquid. I will do my best to remember to come bring you a shot over here so I can show you can see the amount of liquid in here before I move on to the next step of just continuing to cut more up and place it in the pot. Okay, so it's been about 50 minutes is how long it took to get to this point. And you can see that we have a good amount of liquid all around the edges and all around the bottom. So now we have some protection against burning and scorching. So now I can turn the heat up just a tad and really get this process going of rendering down this lard. And just the term rendering down just means melting down and uh, removing the impurities, which we will get to in a future step. So at this point, I'm just going to start uh, grinding up more fat and I'm just going to continue adding it to this pot with my heat turned up a little bit so it'll start melting a little bit faster. And we'll be back when we get to the point of, um, of, of it being full. Okay, so you can see I have it at about 250 degrees and it has been about four to five hours. And here's the stage that we're at, which is the stage when we are ready to start the next part of the process. Um, so what I've been doing is I've just been coming in here about every 30 minutes and giving it a good stir. And I've been waiting until these chunks get less and less and it becomes more and more liquid. I've also been waiting to get this kind of goldeny brownish color to it before I started the next step and that's where we're at. So everything's looking good to start the next step. So let me get you set up and we will show you how that part's done. Okay, let's talk about what all we have here. I have my big eight cup measuring quart glass, not quart, <laughs> eight cup measuring glass. Um, and that's just because it has a pour spout and it's gonna make it a lot easier for me to pour into my jars without making a big mess considering this is stuff is very, very hot. Um, the next thing I have is just a strainer here. I'm gonna put that over the bowl. And then I have just a coffee filter, clean, unused coffee filter. And I'm gonna set that in the bottom. And that's just because I want to filter this lard as, man, this thing is, looks like I'm gonna have to fix my camera stand. Uh, I just want to filter out that um, pork fat as much as possible because any kind of bits of meat or cracklings or just any kind of impurities that might be in the fat, if that goes into my jar, it's not going to be shelf stable for as long as I need it to be shelf stable, which is about a year. Um, so I just wanted to do an extra good job of filtering and that's what I'm going to do. So I'm just going to use my scoop here and I'm just going to start scooping in it and I'm not going to be concerned about if I have some pieces of fat that um, is still in that scoop because it's just going to filter. It's going to get caught in my strainer and not go through to the bottom. I might, you know, I told you all this is my first time doing this. I did a whole lot of reading and researching and watching videos and all of that. Um, but now that I'm seeing how slowly this is filtering through the coffee filter, I'm wondering if I do my first strain. I'm wondering if I do the first strain with just the strainer and then see if any bits fell through and if they did strain again. Or, or maybe I just be patient and get the best product possible. That's probably what I should do. <laughs> it's draining pretty slow with coffee filter but I do think that's going to give me the cleanest um, cleanest end product so I'm just going to stick with that and be patient my uh, measuring cup here has pints and quarts measurements on it so I'm going to go until I get one pint measurement and then I'll put it into the jars and we'll talk about how that how that process works but it really is as easy as just pouring it into the jars at this point I'm going to leave about a one inch head space put this on the towel over here now I say head space but we're not canning this um, it's just that let's say I'm nine months down the road and it we're not moving through it as fast as I thought I would and I'm kind of getting concerned about the shelf life of it I might need to transfer it into the freezer if we're you know getting close to that one year mark and we still haven't gone through it all what is that oh it's a big bug <laughs> 
Um, so because of that possibility, I want to leave a one inch headspace to allow room for expansion as, the, as it freezes. Just as a general rule of thumb, whenever you're freezing something in a mason jar, you want to leave at least a one inch headspace, if not a one and a half inch headspace, to allow for that liquid to expand during the freezing process um, and without bursting your jars. So since that's a possibility, I'm going to go ahead and leave one inch headspace, but if you if let's say you're only doing a couple jars and you know for sure you're going to move through them within three or four months, then you could certainly go to a half inch headspace or quarter inch headspace because like I said, we're not canning this. Um, it's not, um, from what I understand, it's not safe to can fats. We don't want to introduce a 100% oxygen free environment to this fat, um, so we do not want to can it. Um, but it's going to be shelf stable. Fat is like a preservative already. Um, a lot of times if you read um, how the Indians preserved their foods and um, just different Native American cultures, uh, they used fat to as a preservative in a lot of their dried foods. Um, and even, even still today, fat is used as a preservative, um, especially in other cultures, maybe not so much here in America, but in other cultures it is. Um, so this is going to strain. It's taking forever and a day. So I'm going to go ahead and pause the video and we'll be back when we're ready to pour it into the jars. Okay, it is all strained out. So we're going to just go ahead and pour it into pint jar. These are really hot pint jars. I ran the dishwasher over the last hour or so and I put it on the heat cycle, heat dry cycle so that they would get nice and hot and then I just didn't I didn't open my dishwasher door until I was ready to take the jars out so the jars themselves are pretty hot and that's just to avoid temperature shock of that glass really hot really hot um, liquids need to go into hot jars even though we're not canning that's just a standard practice for preventing um, thermal shock <laughs> okay so there we have it to one inch head space and I'm going to go ahead and set this aside. I'm not going to put a lid on it just quite yet. I want it to cool down just a little bit. I don't want a full-blown um, oxygen-free seal with this. So I'm going to let them cool off just a little bit and just keep on doing that process of straining and straining and pouring, straining and pouring. And in the end, you will be left with cracklins, I guess is what they're called. We don't eat cracklins, but... I guess that's what they're called, um, just like a crispy pork fat, I guess. <laughs> um, but that's what will be left in here, but we don't want that going into our jars. But if you like that, then you can eat those too and have a little snack at the end, at the end of a, a long, hard work day. <laughs> okay, we'll be back when all of these jars are filled up and we'll let you know how many pints we got out of 15 pounds of pork fat and just kind of um, go over tips and stuff like that. Okay, so as you can see, I've been straining and pouring and loading up jars. It's kind of a slow process because it's straining a lot slower than I thought it would, um, but I think we're going to end up with a high quality product because of that double layer straining that we're doing. Um, so I want to just, just chat with you about, uh, you know, some storage tips and kind of what I'm going to be doing. So I'm looking in the of a roaster right here and I'm still seeing a lot of chunks of fat that haven't like broken down all the way yet um, and I think if I let this go another maybe three or four hours I'm gonna be able to get a couple of extra jars out of this batch and I want to squeeze out as much as possible because we're not gonna be purchasing any more pig fat this year um, so I really want to hit that at least 12 pint goal Right now we're at about six pints and if I package all of this up right now, I don't think I'm going to get another six pints. But if I continue rendering it down further and further over another few hours, I think I will. The problem is it's getting very late and I'm very tired. Um, so what I'm going to do is just um, tell you about how I'm going to, since these jars are done, I'm going to tell you about how I'm going to be storing them. Um, and then I will take a picture of everything when it's all done so that you can see exactly how many pint jars we got out of 15 pounds. And you can also see what it looks like overnight after it has cooled off. It should change into like a creamy white color. Um, and I will put up on screen over that picture how many jars we ended up with. So as far as storage goes, I'm using reused um, or used canning lids. I still have things you know, marked on them. We're not canning, not a problem. I do want to go ahead and wipe off our rims 
um, just because this is really greasy, obviously. So I just want to ripe our rims, even though we're not canning, just to keep it nice and clean. I've let these jars cool for a little while now. Um, they're not super hot to touch, and it's not going to get that va vacuum seal going from like a hot to cold environment quickly, which is what I want to avoid. So I'm just going to put my lids on. And since we're not canning, I'm going to screw them down all the way. I'm not worried about only going to fingertip tight. Um, and as far as storage goes, I think I mentioned at the beginning of this video that a lot of people store it in the fridge and freezer. I'm going for shelf stability, so I'm going to be putting it on the shelf. That's my goal. Um, and I think from all the research that I've done, I should be able to get close to a year out of it. I am going to be storing it in as cool of a location as I can, which is going to be my laundry room. And I'm going to store it out of direct sunlight, which my laundry room doesn't even have a window in it. So that's not going to be an issue. So out of direct sunlight and in as cool of an env environment as possible. We don't have a basement. Um, we don't have like a separate area of our home that has like an AC unit attached to it. So I'm not worried about any of that. I'm just putting it in the coolest place possible. For some houses that could be a bedroom closet that maybe stays a little bit chillier than the rest of your house. Um, so we have five jars here. I'm still working on that sixth pint. Um, I'm not going to do that quite yet. Um, but here we go. Here is what it's looking like right now. About a one inch headspace. But like I said, if you don't plan on freezing it, you don't have to worry about that headspace. Um, but I will do that picture up on screen, show you what we ended up with. And... Um, I hope this was helpful to y'all. I mean, this I'm no expert, but this is a goal that I've had for a long time, a very specific goal that I had for January of 2024, and I can check that off my list, and that is such a good feeling. And I just wanted to bring y'all along and show you the process and give you some alternatives to using um, like butter. If you run out of that, you can turn to rendered lard. It really is an easy process, a long process because of the straining and the rendering down and the melting of the fat, but still an easy process. Just need some time dedicated to it. Hope that was helpful to y'all. We'll see you next time. Bye.